the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all the desires are and from whom no secrets are given, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may earthly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. and the people multiplied 
and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. The sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her attendants walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thank you, God. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, If the Lord had not been on our side, when the enemies were left against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger for us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent thrown over us. Then would the raging waters have come on my Spirit is saying to God's people. 
God, may your word be spoken, and may your word be heard. Amen. Last year, St. John's was part of a pilot program for small churches called Fostering Imagination. The program from the BTS Center in Maine was based on the book from What Is to What If, by Rob Hopkins. His thesis is that the way to address climate change and other huge social problems is to help people dream and imagine. Because you can't create a different future if you can't imagine it. Hopkins cites studies that show that the rise in screen time and now for adults, that's about 10 hours a day. The rise in screen time is linked with the decline in creativity and imagination. And there are other reasons for this decline, but that's one of them. Hopkins looks at how to foster imagination through connecting to nature, unplugging from technology, creating time and space for play, storytelling, and other avenues. Now, Hopkins is an environmentalist and a climate activist, but his work is super applicable to church. And why? Because God is essentially creative, playful, and imaginative. God not only doesn't color within the lines, God often draws a different picture. Those who closely follow this God also tend to color outside the lines or draw out an entirely new picture. So let's took, look at today's scripture. First up, the birth of Moses. Last week we heard about how Joseph invited his entire extended family, his father Jacob and his 12 siblings and their families, to come to Egypt to weather the Great Famine. And so they came, 
people flocks and herds, and took up residence in Goshen in the north. But over the years, the Egyptians forgot about Joseph, and they started looking down on those Hebrew foreigners, those immigrants. First, they used hard, le hard labor to oppress them. Then, they tried genocide by insisting that the Hebrew midwives kill off all the boy babies to keep them from reproducing. What are God-fearing midwives to do when asked to kill the new lives of their own people? Get creative, of course. They disobey the king of Egypt, and they make up imaginative excuses about why the boys lived. So then the king commanded his own people to throw Hebrew boys into the Nile and kill them. It was into this setting that Moses was born. His mother feared for her son's life, but she also knew she couldn't hide him forever. What's a God-fearing mother to do? Get creative. After nursing him for three months, she put him in a basket and hid it in the reeds on the river, close to where the daughter of Pharaoh would come to bathe. Moses' older sister Miriam watched from a distance. Pharaoh's daughter saw the baby and took pity on him. Meanwhile, Miriam asked if she should go find a Hebrew to nurse the baby. So lo and behold, Miriam found her mother who got to nurse Moses and get paid for it. If that's not imaginative, I don't know what is. Later, Pharaoh's daughter raised Moses as her own son. This is an astonishing story about how God breaks all the rules and gets these faithful women to do so in order to position Moses for his role in leading the people out of oppression many years in the future. The midwives disobey the king. Moses' mother does also, and then cleverly devises a way for her son not only to live, but for her to go on nursing him. And God approves of this creative disobedience. We hear that God rewarded the midwives with families of their own. Moses grew up safely and had a place of honor in the Egyptian court, not unlike his ancestor, Joseph. This week, I heard another story of creative disobedience in the face of oppression. On public radio, it was about Taya Miles' new book, All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake. As a historian, Miles digs into the story of Rose, a slave in the American South in the 19th century, who gave her daughter Ashley a homemade sack before the two were sold and separated. Ashley's granddaughter, Ruth, embroidered the story on the sack many years later. She wrote, or embroidered rather, my great-grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Like the Hebrew women in Egypt, Rose lived a life of oppression and violence. Slave families could just be split up and sold. Rose may have seen this coming after the plantation owner died, so she engaged in creative resistance, putting together the few items she could, nutritious nuts gathered or poached from the land, a dress that she made with scraps, hair from her own body, so that her daughter would not forget her or feel abandoned. The end of the short story on the sack <clears throat> Rose told her, it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. A painful end. Mother and daughter were never reunited. Yet it is a powerful testament to love, hope, and resistance. Ashley carried this sack filled with love that no one could destroy. Love gets creative. Love is at the heart of God's creative and imaginative creativity and at the heart of those who embody God. 
in those who defy oppressors to make sure their children live, in those who risk their own well-being for others. Jesus, of course, exemplifies this. His life and ministry is dedicated to bringing the creative power of God love to people, to all kinds of people. And he breaks every rule and social convention to do it. Talking to women? Check. Eating with sinners? Check. Healing on the Sabbath? Check. Touching dead people? Challenging religious and political leaders? Feeding and healing Gentiles? Check, check, check. Now, not everybody is happy when he breaks rules, but he loves colors outside the lines. God's love knows no bounds. Today's gospel illustrates this as well. People are trying to figure out who Jesus is, but he does not fit into any neat box, no coloring book picture. Is he John the Baptist, come back alive? Or is he one of the ancient prophets? Or Elijah. So Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, stop the presses. Peter got something right. <laughs> and Jesus said, Yeah, you got that. God revealed it to you. And you are Peter, which means rocky, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, this is where it gets really incredible. Of all the disciples, Peter is probably the one who is the least stable and least rock-like. <laughs> so is Jesus being ironic here or making a joke? I mean, Peter is rash. He's impetuous. He does not think before he speaks or acts. <coughs> he changes his mind. He denies Jesus. So God is really stretching here. I'm going to found my church on the most fallible, flighty, and changeable of all the disciples just because. Because maybe Jesus saw something in Peter that others couldn't see. Or maybe because God knew that through the crucible of Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter would be changed and become that rock. How imaginative is that? Jesus has a huge love and a huge capacity to forgive the disciples' failings and Peter's. Jesus saw a future with Peter as a leader. God's love will find a way, a way to defy oppressors and save children and a whole people, a way to keep a split family bonded together, a way to make a church out of scared disciples. God continues to look for entry into our lives, to stir us up, to get us going, to spark creativity, to use us with all of our failings for good. And that has been my experience here among you. We are coming to the end of two years together. One more week to go. It has been a blessed time. As a creative person and a change agent, I was welcomed in by you with open arms and open hearts. We've had fun together. We face some tough issues. It's never, never, never been boring. Now this is not a big church, a fancy church, a high-powered church. It's a small church with an aging congregation, with most of the challenges that small churches are facing these days. But one thing that is super apparent to me is that this is a church with a lot of love. You love each other. You love God. You have love for others and for serving the wider community. And your God-filled love has a lot of capacity for imagination and creativity. It's definitely in your DNA to be creative. You love music and the arts. 
You got together with other churches a number of years ago and started the Grace Center to give homeless and struggling people safe shelter and food during the day. When COVID came, you kept up a digital choir, a digital choir in your digital worship. And you got creative with pastoral care, staying in touch with each other, and even delivering Christmas and Easter care packages to every household. And since I came, I have just seen that creativity blossom. There have been little things, like using native grasses instead of palms on Palm Sunday, and replacing some of the sermons with interactive times. And there were bigger things. We struggled to figure out how to help Ben, the man who lived here in his car. It was Ellen's persistence and willingness to do whatever she could in walking with him that finally got him supportive housing. God's hand was surely there. When Mark Nelson, longtime music director, retired, we all wondered how we were going to survive without him. Honestly, the man did everything. Of course, what did we do? With God's leading, we got creative. I realized that I wasn't going to pick out all the hymns by myself and ask if anybody wanted to help. Four or five people have been consistently helpful in this regard. We formed ad hoc groups to help plan liturgy. Rosemary got re-energized on Flower Guild, and we've changed things up. Norm has stepped up and has improved the recording of our service. It's God's creativity at work in us. You've been open to trying out different forms of the Eucharist, the prayers, even creeds. The thrift shop has experimented with different forms of staffing and new ventures into online sales. We created a visioning team to explore different ways of being church and connecting with the community, which led to the Fostering Imagination program. Experimental beach worship was a big success, and we spent time dreaming up what-if questions to get the juices starting to flow. This spring, Connie and Claudette initiated the Becoming Beloved Community Social Justice Series during worship. They just came to me and said, hey, we want to do this. Are you okay with it? Sure. Sure. And the visioning team explored different groups to potentially reach out to. Now the question is, of course, what next? What relationships does this church need to build? What stories do you need to hear? How is there going to be this connection of what you love and what the world needs? And if you're not sure, take time to pray together and call on the Holy Spirit, as you will see that she will show up and creatively lead you. Yes, I've stirred up some things, but honestly, my role here has never been about telling you what to do. You wouldn't put up with that anyway. <laughs> or doing everything myself, I wouldn't put up with that. But asking questions, speaking the truth, speaking the truth about God, praying a lot, giving encouragement, and making space for you to do your thing. God is love and creativity. And all of these things are evident here. Now, I can tell you with certainty what is ahead for you. More change, <laughs> an unknown future, another clergy transition, more climate change, more social change. I know, that's not really very helpful, is it? Except that it reminds us that now is the perfect time to root deep into the love of God and be open to the Spirit's creative leadings. Your new priest, Maria, will be blessed to be your priest in charge. And you are fortunate to have her. But she is not going to walk in here and solve all your problems. Just get rid of that thought right now. She will walk with you into the future, bringing her own gifts and creativity 
and love of God, to join you with your gifts and creativity and love of God. You have what you need, an amazing staff, wonderful wardens and leaders, dedication to God, a heart for the community. The God who created you and loves you will keep seeking every kind of creative way to lead you forward. So hold on to that. Do not forget that. Do not forget the love that is here. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that your creation did not stop when you made the world and all in it, but you keep creating, you keep looking for imaginative ways to let us know about your love and to guide us. We thank you for this congregation here. We ask your blessing upon it, upon all of us as we move forward. May we rely on your love and look for your creativity to guide us in the days and years ahead. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You created our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are our God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous. We are beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ. Who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You are God, our Holy Spirit. You empower us to be the gospel in the world. You reconcile the appeal. You overcome death. You are our God. We worship. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victories of honor, fear, injustice, and oppression. <clears throat> For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friends, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who make the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop. Alan and Carol, our bishops, for the vestry and leaders of St. John's, and for all who follow Christ. For all who serve God and the church. For the special needs and congregation uh, and concerns of this congregation. For the Dow family. For Pat. And for Marjorie. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. This community, to my daughters on their birthday. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. For all who died in the wildfire fires on Maui. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. 
God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you. Good shepherd, have mercy on us. Though we do not resist evil, we repent. 
good Savior, deliver us. We bless you for strengthening us by the witness of our ancestors, by the blood of martyrs, the constancy of exiles, the fortitude of prophets, the holiness of life of those who have gone before us. We bless you for giving Blessed Mary and John and all the saints as our companions at work and at table. We bless you for armoring us with light for the work of justice and encircling us with your constant love. And so we raise our voices in the endless hymn of praise we share with all the saints and with angels and archangels as we sing.
abiding spirit bless you now and forevermore. Amen.